Good afternoon, Comets, and welcome to this presidential town hall. I'm Rafael Martin, your vice president and chief of staff, and I will be serving as moderator for today's event. Thank you all for the many questions that we received through the town hall at utdallas.edu email inbox. And I'll remind you that additional questions can be posted through the chat function for this event. We'll try to get to as many as we can, but as you can imagine, we have a lot of ground to cover this afternoon. But before we get to your questions, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce UT Dallas President, Dr. Richard C. Benson for some opening remarks. Dr. Benson. Thank you, Raphael, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for a discussion of matters important to you and to UT Dallas. Before we move into the town hall format, I would like to speak to a topic of great importance to me personally and to our university. We hold dear our institution's values of community, diversity, and inclusion. And as such, we must challenge ourselves to do more to understand the impact of systematic racism on our students, staff, and faculty. I know that we can meet this challenge. This is why I've established the task force that will look deeply into issues of fairness and inclusion at UT Dallas and let us know how we can do a better job. I expect this team to do a lot of listening and to seek out many viewpoints. Most importantly, the task force will make recommendations by the start of the fall semester, if not sooner, that are actionable and will lead to improvements in inclusion, access, and equity for all. This task force will be representative of the broader campus community. It will be led by Dr. George Fair, Vice President for Diversity and Community Engagement and co-chaired by Rafael Martin. We take diversity seriously at UT Dallas, so I want to commend the recent decision by the U.S. Supreme Court to allow the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Act to remain in effect. These DACA students, often called dreamers, have much to offer our community and our campus. I note, I note too, a second Supreme Court decision which ruled that the 1964 Civil Rights Act protects gay, lesbian, and transgender employees from discrimination based on sex. This is a tremendous victory for the LGBT plus community and one that I celebrate. I note that UT Dallas scores five out of five stars on the Campus Pride Index and was ranked 14th in the nation and well ahead of any other university in Texas. We can take great pride in the great work coming out of the Multicultural Center, the Galderstein Gender Center, and other UTD programs, but we cannot be satisfied with the status quo. Many of us at UTD believe that this is the time for meeting, meaningful discussion followed by change in how we treat one another. It has become all the more essential to fulfill our mission as a public university. And as a public university, we strive to be open in our communications. That is why we are here today to continue our conversation about issues that are relevant for the return to campus and operations in the fall semester and beyond. Our first town hall was held in April. It originated with the Academic Senate and was quickly embraced by the staff council and student government. It was so well received that we have elected to continue to gather our community in this virtual format. And once again, I'm very grateful to Ravi Prakash, Speaker of the Academic Senate, Brooke Schaefer, President of the Staff Council, and Ayub Mohammed and Hope Khoury, President and Vice President of the Student uh, Government. Thank you all for your leadership. Turning now to the submitted questions, it is always interesting to see the range of inquiry Many questions fell into similar categories and those will be addressed theme by theme here. Given the town hall format, some questions might not get answered in the next hour. And if that happens, we will provide an answer to the person who submitted the question by email. I'm joined today by some members of the university leadership team and will refer some categories of questions to them. You've already been introduced to our moderator, Rafael Martin. Helping answer the questions will be Inga Musselman, our provost, Terry Pankratz, VP for Budget and Finance, Calvin Jamison, VP for Facilities and Economic Development, Joe Pancrazio, VP for Research, Gene Fitch, VP for Student Affairs, Colleen Dutton, Chief Human Resources Officer, and once again, Rafael Martin, Chief of Staff. Thank you all. Before we move to your questions, I also want to express my gratitude for what has been accomplished over the last few months. Summer classes were moved online with very few problems. Students and employees, uh, employee programming moved to virtual formats and allowed us to stay connected to each other remotely. Return to campus guidelines have been created and posted for employees and students. Plans for fall classes have been announced. Research is resuming on campus in phases. Buildings and facilities are being adapted for the return to campus, including measures based on the best practices for social distancing and sanitization. And this is a good place to acknowledge the vital contributions of the faculty and staff at UT Dallas. 
Thank you for your preparing for the outstanding students who are studying with us this summer and for those who will be joining or returning in the fall. And for those essential employees who never stopped working on our campus, thank you. You have provided a tremendous service to this university. And so a, a bit about the current state of the university. Summer enrollment numbers are at record levels, although for a less than satisfying reason, many of our students and recent graduates are finding it impossible to find a summer job or that first job after graduation. And wisely, they are electing to get a further jump on their education. We are seeing some improvement in our projected fall enrollment, but we remain concerned about the impact that the pandemic will have on our numbers. As I said before, a drop in enrollment, which looks increasingly likely, would have a significant economic effect. We have announced steps that we are taking to address these concerns and continue to look for ways to offset our financial deficit that causes the least amount of harm. As I said in April, we are doing our very best to support our faculty and staff and to minimize the reductions that we will have to make. Essentially, every action we take leads us back to our mission to provide a rigorous and quality academic experience for our students. We will need everyone's help to ensure that we fulfill our mission in a safe and healthy environment. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Benson. Uh, the first set of questions that we will uh, answer deal with the topics of racism and diversity. The first question for you, Dr. Benson, how are staff, <laughs> students, and faculty being encouraged to address inherent bias? Well, thank you, Raphael. Very important question. And I would like to break this down into two components, work that is already underway through the Office of Diversity and Community Engagement, led by Vice President George Fair and newer initiatives. There is a broad spectrum of activities within the Office of Diversity and, Commu and, and uh, Community Engagement. These include the work of the Multicultural Center and the Galderstein Gender Center. In addition, throughout the year, there are numerous activities that deal directly with how we engage with people who are different from ourselves, how we address our own inherent biases, and how we diversify our community. To be sure, there is more work to be done, which is why we are looking into the new Living Our Values Task Force to provide us with recommendations on how we can better address inherent bias in our community. The Living Our Values Task Force uh, charge is to provide actionable recommendations to the president on how to manifest our values of community diversity and inclusion, how to identify and address systemic racism, and how to improve access and equity for all at our institution. And I want to add one more point here. This has got to be an effort that unites all segments of the UTD community. We cannot leave it to just the African-American community to address problems of systematic racism. Whites, Hispanics, Asians, and others must join in this battle. Thank you, sir. Is it possible to include diverse celebrations such as Juneteenth, Indigenous, Indigenous Peoples Day, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, Lunar Chinese New Year, and or holidays centered around Ramadan, Islamic holidays at the university? Well, most definitely, yes. In fact, we do celebrate all of these holidays and events on campus. In fact, we just concluded five days of celebration of Juneteenth. The staff and the programs of the Multicultural Center are at the heart of many of these celebrations, and they do a great job of recognizing and celebrating the diversity on campus. If there are groups uh, or celebrations that our community would like to see recognized that are not already part of the Multicultural Center's programming, I would encourage them uh, to contact the director, Arthur Gregg, and his staff. Thank you, sir. Will the black student body receive a response back from President Benson regarding our call for changes on campus? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, I received a very thoughtful letter from this group offering numerous changes and initiatives for me to review and consider. And I am personally committed to help resolve the issues identified in that letter. I have forwarded it to George Fair and Rafael Martin, co-chairs of the Living Our Values Task Force. And I expect if they have not done so already, that they will ask the representatives from the black student body to participate in this university-wide effort. How will UTD protect freedom of speech and the exchange of ideas on campus? Thank you, another important question. In fact, I anticipate it. And so I, I actually wanna go back to something that I said in my convocation speech from 2016 when I was as new as our entering students. And then I gave seven points of advice and one was to embrace diversity. Um, and I would like to repeat what I said in 2016, and I'm quoting myself now. You are about to make friends with many scholars who have vastly different life experiences than you. Learn from them and share your story too. 
This also applies to the diversity of ideas. Allow yourself to be challenged. Present your own arguments when you feel strongly about a matter, but always do so in a respectful way. It is okay to hold your ground in a dorm room debate, but as a rule of thumb, if you never change your mind on any topic, then it's a safe bet that you are not learning and you are not growing intellectually. Thank you, sir. The final question in this section is directed towards Provost Musselman. I have, I have only had one African-American professor in my two years of being a student at UT Dallas. What are UTD's plans to attract more African-American professors? Oh, thank you, Raphael. The university is working um, actively to hire diverse faculty and to retain them. For the past three years and also going forward, a provost team currently existing of Dr. Stephen Spiro and Ms. Vicki Carlisle, along with the Director of Institutional Equity, is meeting with every tenure and tenure track search committee. One of the goals of the meeting is to educate the search committee about the development of large and diverse applicant pools and the recruitment of the very best um, applicants. Data from the survey of earned doctorates is shared to provide the committee with demographic information about recent PhD graduates in their fields. Um, in addition, UT Dallas also has plans for the submission of an NSF advance grant or organizational change for gender equity in STEM academic professions. The NSF Advance Program provides grants to enhance the systemic factors that support equity and inclusion and also to mitigate the systemic factors that create inequities in the academic profession and workplaces. Thank you, Dr. Musselman. Uh, the next section of questions deals with uh, policing and our police force here at UT Dallas. And as the administrator uh, with oversight of our police department, I'll try to answer these questions. Uh, the first question, is there a UT Dallas Police Oversight Board or committee to address complaints and to ensure accountability? Uh, the University Safety and Security Council, a university-wide standing committee, has oversight for broad safety and security issues on campus uh, and includes the leadership of our police department. However, it's not charged directly with police oversight or accountability. Um, at the request of Dr. Benson, I've recently convened a police task force charged with providing recommendations to the president on what roles our police force should play in our community and how our police force should operate to ensure the trust and support of our community. I expect the work of this task force to parallel uh, and complement the work of the Living Our Values task force that Dr. Benson mentioned earlier. Uh, the police task force will certainly be looking at issues of oversight and accountability and will make recommendations to address any issues that they might discover. The next question, what is the UT Dallas police policy regarding use of deadly force and chokeholds if those are not considered deadly force? Uh, uh, our police policies are set by uh, the UT system director of police. Uh, and are, I will point out, are available for view uh, on the Director of Police website at UT System. Uh, the, use of the use of force policy, uh, it's policy 601, uh, defines chokeholds as a use of deadly force and strictly prohibits the use of chokeholds by our officers. What training do UT Dallas police officers receive regarding de-escalation and working with individuals with mental health differences? Um, all of our officers are trained in de-escalation techniques and in dealing with individuals with mental illness. Um, in fact, all of our officers are required to become certified mental health peace officers, which is a 40 hour training course. And we were actually the first department in the UT system to have all of our officers and detectives receive that certification. Does the UT Dallas administration and UTD police leadership encourage officers to intervene and report if they witness officer misconduct? Um, the short answer is yes, we do encourage that, but I think more importantly, um, that intervention is required under the policies and regulations uh, that, the pol that the police department operates under. Uh, both the use of force policy and the code of conduct policy for the police department 
require officers to intervene if they see an abuse of power or any misconduct by a fellow officer. Um, I, I'll also point out that uh, our police department is required to file a, a couple of reports uh, that, are, that are pertinent to this discussion. One is a use of force report uh, and the other is a racial profiling report. And both of those reports are available uh, at the Director of Police website at UT System. Uh, and if you are interested in these topics, I would encourage you to download them and, and take a look at them. And I think you will find that they show our police department in a, a very positive light. Um, finally, let me, uh, I, I just wanna take the opportunity to uh, highlight some presentations uh, that are scheduled by our Chief of Police, Larry Zacharias. Um, he will be presenting to the Human Resources Forum on July 1st and to upcoming Academic Senate and Staff Council meetings. Uh, and I know he always welcomes uh, the input and interaction of our campus community, and we'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have about our police department. Now turning to uh, a new topic, uh, safely returning to campus. Uh, Dr. Benson, this question is for you. What does UT Dallas think, excuse me, why does UT Dallas think it is safe to bring people together four or five times a week especially when COVID-19 cases are on a significant rise in both Dallas and Collin counties. Well, thank you. Um, I want to start out by saying we're being very cautious. To date, only essential personnel, that's facilities and public safety, and a very limited number of researchers have been on campus. We had hoped to increase this number in the near future, but the COVID-19 metrics in the North Texas region in recent weeks have not looked good. We will wait as long as possible to bring faculty and staff back to campus, and we may not bring some people back to work on campus for the duration of the fall semester. Priority will be given to those staff that are needed to prepare our campus for students and or those who are needed to serve our students directly. I would add that our goal is to make the UT Dallas campus as safe or safer than whatever the alternative may be. For example, I would like for our residence halls to be safer than any apartment complex in town. I would like for our dining facilities to be safer than any commercial restaurant. The point is that the faculty, staff, and students of UTD will spend 24 hours in a day somewhere, and I want, to be UT, I want UTD to be as safe an option as they have. I also want to reemphasize that students and instructors who do not want to be in the classroom do not have to be. We are giving them the option to deliver and receive their education remotely, and I believe that others We'll discuss uh, more specific measures to mitigate infection risk and protect the faculty, staff, and students later in this, in this discussion. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question, will the university require faculty and students to wear masks during class? If so, will the university provide faculty and students with masks to wear? Um, I, I can respond to that question. Uh, yes, we are going to require everyone to wear a mask or cloth face covering anywhere inside facilities at UT Dallas, um, and that includes classrooms. Um, we will, we have already got an order of masks uh, on campus that we will uh, distribute to faculty and staff members returning to campus. And uh, in the fall, we will have, uh, when the semester starts, we'll have a limited supply of masks to hand out to students as well. Um, I'm, I understand that the bookstore will also have masks available for sale uh, once the fall semester starts. Uh, will we be performing temperature checks at every building? Uh, I can respond to that one as well. Uh, the answer is no. Um, the nature of our campus and the nature of our buildings really does not lend itself to performing temperature checks. We would have to uh, limit access to, the, to our buildings uh, and essentially create backups or queues uh, at those entry points, which is exactly what we don't want to do uh, in this environment. We want to keep density as low as possible, um, and we are taking other measures um, uh, to keep people safe while they're on campus, um, which is a, a good segue into the next question, uh, which I'll direct to uh, Dr. Jameson. What measures will the university take to reduce infection risks and to keep the campus safe? Thank you, Raphael. Um, before I go on, just want to acknowledge um, the group that never left campus, the facilities group and the public safety individuals here making sure that things were okay. Basically, we have an aggressive effort to uh, clean the campus, uh, daily cleaning of the classrooms and hallway spaces, and then all the open spaces. We have a process in place to address that. 
uh, between classes, we'll be working hard to make sure we disinfect uh, the act, disinfect the campus as well. Uh, making sure that there's social distancing is adhered to in terms of approaching the campus. You mentioned earlier the supplies for faculty and staff. Indeed, we do have uh, in place now, there are some cloth masks. So with each department that makes the decision to return to campus, there's a process in place by which you can have, you can pick up um, bottles of hand sanitation and reusable cloth masks for each faculty and staff member. And then um, these are sort of starter kits to help you with disinfectant and wipes to assist you in your respective office space. In addition, there's building signage, uh, and their signage says that uh, throughout the campus itself, um, for each of the buildings, it reminds you to wear your mask or you cannot enter the buildings in terms of what you do overall, and those be throughout the hallways as well. So all of that is being addressed. And then um, a couple other items that are important for us to understand, we will no longer have the Comet Cab service um, uh, because of the social distancing issues. Um, it will won't, it will, will probably be good for our wellness program with more people walking on campus overall. Um, but in addition to that, um, we will assist students who need to have the accessible caps will still be available in terms of what we do. The other thing that we're doing to make sure that we address the safety issues is the dining services, food services. So all of our retail services we have on campus will be uh, Establish such that you can use our tow bar or robots will be in full service. We have uh, so you can order on, online. We we'll do a lot of box meals in terms of what we're doing and limit the amount of contact that you have but making sure that you do have access to food services on our campus itself. And, and that would be a large part of what we're doing. Thank you, Dr. Jameson. Um, Next question, how do you plan to enforce the public safety guidelines, public health guidelines? Will someone be tasked with enforcement such as breaking up gatherings or groups? Um, no, there's not going to be a specific group uh, or individuals that will be tasked for enforcing these guidelines. Um, I think it, it's important to emphasize that going into the fall semester, we are going to have to uh, pull together and really develop some new habits uh, as a campus and as a community. Um, when you come back to campus, you will see uh, a lot of signage, as Dr. Jamison mentioned, um, that will be branded Comets United. That is our outreach effort uh, to our campus, to our faculty, staff, and students to remind us that we all need to take action to protect each other uh, while COVID-19 is still a threat. Um, so it really will be, uh, everybody's responsibility to make sure that people are following guidelines. Uh, we want people to politely ask if so you see somebody that doesn't have a mask on uh, in an indoor space, ask them if they have a mask. We will try to, we will get them one. Um, if, if we encounter individuals who refuse to follow the guidelines, they will be referred either if they're faculty or staff to their supervisor or to the Dean of Students first for counseling uh, and and some education about why these matters are important, why these guidelines are important. Um, and if they persist, uh, then into disciplinary proceedings. We're, we're going to take this very seriously, but it's important to recognize that it's everybody's responsibility uh, to protect each other uh, in, the, in these times. Um, the next question, have, we, have there been any confirmed cases uh, on campus? If students, faculty, or staff have come into contact with COVID-19 or have tested positive while away from UT Dallas, will they be allowed on campus? Um, I'll answer the first part of this question, and then I think I'll turn it over to uh, Colleen Dutton, our Chief Human Resources Officer, to talk a little bit about kind of uh, screening and other measures we're going to put in place uh, for the fall. Um, so the answer is yes, we have had uh, five cases on campus. Um, interestingly enough, just uh, over the past week and a half or so, three uh, of the cases were students living in uh, the University Village apartments. They were all roommates, uh, so all of those cases are related. We had one student uh, living off campus, but who was participating in clinical activities at the Callier Center in Dallas. Uh, and we had one um, member of one of our custodial contractor uh, crews who uh, tested positive, um, but those are the only reported cases uh, on campus. Um, 
Colleen, do you want to discuss uh, some of our screening and other measures we're going to take um, uh, when we return in the fall? Yes, thank you, Raphael. And good afternoon, everyone. So, employees returning to the workplace will be asked to conduct symptom monitoring and complete a screening questionnaire daily before reporting to work. They must be free of any symptoms potentially related to COVID-19 before they can return to campus. We also have a designated COVID-19 health screening and training coordinator. Carlinda Pogue will serve as this primary contact for employees and students to self-report or to um, uh, discuss a confirmed case or ask questions or seek guidance. The email has been, an email has been set up that is c19resource at utdallas.edu. That has been established to triage inquiries that we can either respond to or refer to the appropriate campus campus contacts. Anyone with a suspected or presumed positive case will be asked to self-isolate. Students that are in on-campus housing who are confirmed to have COVID-19 will be quarantined in single occupancy apartments that have been reserved for this purpose. Any student cases will be managed between the coordinator and with the Office of Student Affairs. Information about confirmed cases on campus can be found on the COVID-19 website under updates. We'll be sharing what information we can legally provide on that website. Thank you, Colleen. Um, the next question, why wasn't the entire student body notified about the reported cases of COVID-19? Um, I'm assuming this refers to the cases uh, which I referenced earlier of the students living in University Village. Um, for the existing positive cases, um, including the student who was at Calgary Center, we didn't feel that it was necessary to alert the entire campus uh, because with the campus closed, um, we knew uh, essentially who the infected individuals had been in contact with and we were able to uh, inform those groups. Um, and so, uh, however, I, I will say that there there is a section on our COVID-19 website um, where we, we list all positive cases uh, on campus and you are welcome to refer to that. Um, that said, uh, I, I certainly expect as we bring students back to campus and open our campus facilities in the fall, you are going to see more general campus notifications about positive cases uh, because we will just have to assume that people were multiple places on campus and we won't necessarily have known who they interacted with. Um, but I think as, as you will hear later uh, from Dr. Musselman, everything that we are doing uh, to prepare for the fall is to try to maintain social distancing uh, and prevent people from coming into close contact with one another to minimize the risk. Um, but we will be uh, informing the campus as appropriate when we have positive cases uh, in the fall. Will the university provide COVID-19 testing to faculty and staff returning to work in the fall? Um, no, the university will not. Uh, we, we just do not have the resources or the capacity to do so. Um, as Colleen mentioned, we're going to focus on health screening and, um, and referring individuals as appropriate to their healthcare providers and or the Student Health Center. Uh, my understanding is that the Student Health Center will have the capacity to do some COVID-19 testing, um, so students will have access to that, uh, to that uh, capability. Um, the next question uh, concerning uh, personnel issues, I'm going to direct back to uh, Colleen. What accommodations are available for those dealing with lack of child care as they are asked to return to work? Okay. Employees requested to report back to campus but who may not have adequate child care at home should discuss these options with their supervisor to see if it's possible for them to work remotely or maybe have an alternative work schedule. Um, and as a reminder, eligible employees may receive up to 80 hours of paid leave under the Families First Coronavirus Act uh, for child care or personal health care needs. And you can find additional information about the act and the leave options uh, via the UTD COVID-19 website. 
we have so much uncertainty with COVID-19 and our return to campus still ahead, and we are asking supervisors to be as flexible as possible. Um, employees may have additional caregiving responsibilities, child care responsibilities, um, teaching responsibilities uh, with, with their children. They may have other caregiver responsibilities with other family members um, due to limited resources and other restrictions that are in place. And so the employee relations team in HR is available to assist employees and managers uh, with these discussions um, and also in assessing options that might be available. And you can contact the employee relations team at employeerelations at utdallas.edu. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, moving on to a new topic, research, uh, which I will direct to our Vice President for Research, Joe Pancrazio. Are PhD students allowed to access labs or offices on a regular basis in the coming months? Thank you, Raphael. Uh, yes, graduate students um, are allowed to access research laboratories. Uh, keep in mind, since May 26th, we've had in place a limited return to research at a level of about 25%, where individual graduate students can work with their PIs to preserve blocks of time to pursue on-site da on data collection. We recently expanded the available hours in the lab to 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., which allows additional opportunities for faculty, staff, and students to engage in laboratory work on site. Now, the expectations for anyone returning to campus include completion of the daily health survey that Colleen and Raphael mentioned, and use of our reservation system for check-in and check-out and compliance with social distancing and other behaviors such as wearing face masks and maintaining good hand hygiene. I would also take the opportunity to remind everyone that anything that can be done remotely, such as data analysis, group meetings, meetings with your PI, or manuscript preparation should continue to be performed remotely. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, a follow-up question uh, from the chat. Um, are all research labs going to be open in the fall? Yes, all research laboratories are available for opening. It's uh, up to the principal investigator about making um, making available slots within the laboratory to conduct on-site research. Very good, thank you. Um, moving on uh, to the topic of uh, budgets and, and refunds and financial support, um, I'll direct this question to our Vice President for Budget and Finance, Terry Pankratz. What cuts are being considered, if any, in addition to those already announced? Thanks for the question, Raphael. Uh, as you know, we've completed our initial round of budget reductions in anticipation of declining revenues in the fall semester. And we're in the early stages of discussing what additional uh, re reductions may be required if our efforts to maintain enrollment are not successful. Uh, if further reductions are necessary, our planning group is discussing a targeted approach to avoid marginalizing all program areas. As you might imagine, these are very difficult decisions. I want to stress that no decisions have been made regarding additional budget reductions and that we will continue to monitor student registrations and our actions will correspond to the magnitude of the enrollment decline. Thank you, Terry. Uh, another question. If someone is paid from outside sources, uh, mainly grants, are they eligible to receive a salary increase for FY21? Sure, it's a great question. I realize that uh, uh, many externally funded contracts often have guidelines that may vary from uh, existing campus procedures, but all UTD employees are held to the same salary administration standards regardless of funding source. Uh, so once we reinstate salary increases, all UTD employees will again be eligible uh, for salary increases. Thank you. Um, I'm I believe this next question uh, can be directed to Colleen. Will there be offers of early retirement packages for staff? There are no plans to offer early retirement packages at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Terry, back to you. Are there plans for any other financial assistance to students beyond the CARES Act and traditional financial aid? At this time, nothing in addition to what we've currently provided, but I do want to reiterate that that we've provided uh, federal CARES funding, we've provided financial assistance through gifts that have been raised for that purpose. We've also set aside uh, university reserves to help provide student assistance uh, during the spring and perhaps into the fall. Uh, we do have uh, a comprehensive array of financial assistance available at UT Dallas, and I would encourage uh, anyone to contact our financial aid office 
to learn what may be available uh, for their for their needs. Thank you, Terry. Um, one final question, which was a very popular question uh, submitted. I'm going to direct this to, uh, to Dr. Benson. Will tuition for online classes be discounted? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, tuition will be the same for all classes, regardless of whether they are in person, hybrid or online. I want to emphasize that we continue to provide the best educational experience possible. And one of the most critical elements of making this happen uh, are our faculty and staff, and it is proper that they be paid for the professional work that they do. Thank you, sir. Um, now I would like to move on to uh, some questions uh, about uh, academics and classes in the fall. Obviously, we received uh, a great number of questions about those topics, and uh, I'm just going to direct a general question to our provost, Dr. Musselman. Um, what, Dr. Musselman, can you give a, can you tell us about the plan uh, for fall classes and academics? Raphael, thank you for the question. Um, I would like to. Uh, uh, just talk to the um, group here about what or what our plans are for the fall uh, 2020 semester and specifically talking about the fall 2020 course schedule. Um, there have been many conversations over the past two months with many groups with um, with faculty, staff and administrators and a large number of questions with the academic continuity working group. And what has come out of all of these conversations is a framework for the for uh, the fall 2020 um, course schedule. And so I, I have a working draft of that framework um, that I expect to be complete within the week. And so I will share you um, the basics um, that are aligned with this framework. So as a starting point, a point of introduction, um, the framework for the fall 2020 courses is designed to accomplish four things. Uh, one is to deliver UT Dallas's educational mission. A second is to provide maximum flexibility for faculty teaching and for student learning preferences. A third is to follow Centers for Disease Control, Control and Prevention considerations for institutes of higher education to slow the spread of COVID-19. And the fourth is to enable the campus to transition completely to remote learning with short notice if necessary. The second part of the framework uh, addresses the fall 2020 academic calendar. And um, the proposed academic calendar comes out of the faculty survey where 74% of the faculty who responded to the survey preferred uh, the, this particular calendar. And the calendar is that classes would begin on Monday August 17th as planned, as scheduled. Um, the last day of classes would be Wednesday, November 25th, the day before Thanksgiving, and that all final exams, both take home and online, uh, would be scheduled after Thanksgiving. So this is the calendar that we are uh, leaning towards at this point, and I'm take, currently taking the steps with the calendar committee and the registrar to, um, to hopefully finalize this calendar. Um, there are some university expectations in the classrooms and instructional laboratories, and um, Raphael talked about some of these earlier. Um, all occupants of rooms that will be used for classrooms and la laboratory instruction must wear face coverings and maintain six foot social distancing at all times. In the last several weeks, the Office of Facilities um, has been um, looking at each classroom and revising the maximum occupancy of these classrooms according to six foot social distancing guidelines. So the work has been completed for the 110 classrooms. Those are the standard uh, uh, classrooms that have tables and chairs in them, and they are currently underway for the 210 classrooms. Those are classrooms with special equipment um, for example for arts and um, performance or for um, instructional laboratories and facilities is also looking at a few large rooms um, that are not currently used as classrooms but may be used as classrooms in the fall what we've learned so far for the 110 classrooms is that the social distance capacity ranges from 14 percent to 16 percent of normal capacity and that really depends on the configuration of the furniture in the room 
um, students will occupy the classroom seats that conform to these guidelines and other seating will be removed or clearly marked um, to not be used. Another aspect of this framework um, has to do with faculty teaching preference. So the mode of instruction for individual classes will be determined per consultations between the classroom instructor and appropriate administrators at the program and school levels, considering pedagogical concerns, student enrollment, space requirements and classroom configurations, space availability, and instructor needs and preferences. Instructors at every rank and status will have a range of options to choose from, ranging from the traditional classroom or laboratory course to the fully online course. And I will describe these options in a few minutes. In addition, as already announced by the university, all classes must include an option for students to take the class remotely and to do so asynchronously. Another part of the framework addresses academic advising and notification to students. Um, as you know, students are currently registering for courses according to the published fall 2020 course schedule. Over the next few weeks, the course schedule will be updated to list the modality of each course section. In July, the registrar will notify each student by email of any changes in the modality of their scheduled courses, and students will then be able to make changes once the course schedule is updated. The next section of the framework has to do with student choices of classes. Students will choose among courses available in the following modalities and may elect to have their course load include more than one modality. So we are planning for offering courses in five course modalities. So I'd like to list them and give brief definitions. The first is the, is the traditional classroom or the traditional laboratory course. We would also call this face-to-face. -face. In this mode, the instructor and students are present in the classroom or laboratory each class meeting according to the class schedule. The availability of courses in this modality will likely be limited due to classroom availability. A second modality is what we would call a blended or hybrid classroom course in which online activity is mixed with face-to-face -face meetings in the classrooms. The instructor and students meet all together face-to-face -to -face one or two days a week and these face-to-face -face meetings are then accompanied by online instruction. A third modality is called flexible mode course, or you may have heard the term high flex blended learning. In this modality, online activity is mixed with classroom face to face meetings. Specifically, UT Dallas is implementing a student group rotation model wherein faculty deliver instruction face to face during each class meeting and students attend lecture face to face one day per week. So students will attend class online with synchronous, that is real time, transmission of the lecture when they are not in the classroom face to face. A fourth modality is what we would term remote or virtual course. These are lectures delivered online in real time according to the day and time in the class schedule. In other words, they're delivered synchronously. In this mode, the instructor lectures from home or from the office and students complete the course at a distance. Um, I would note that these courses really are traditional classroom courses that faculty would be offering virtually in the fall 2020 semester to similarly to the way in which they were offered at the end of the spring semester. And then the fifth modality is the fully online course. These are courses that are designed with the truly distant student in mind and students complete these courses at a distance. So those are the five course modalities. Um, I want to talk a little bit then about asynchronous access and then synchronous access. So asynchronous access just means not in real time. Um, so all courses, regardless of the modality, will have an asynchronous access that is not in real time so that students who cannot or choose not to return to campus can take their courses online.
for all courses, syllabi, course assignments, lecture recordings, and so forth will be posted to e-learning e so that they can be accessed by students outside of scheduled class time. By uh, incorporating asynchronous access into every course, faculty and students will be prepared to transition off campus if required by COVID-19. And this is really important. And this is the reason why we are asking that every course have this asynchronous access. We have to be ready. We have to be flexible. We have to be able to pivot and turn off campus really on a moment's no notice if, if necessary and to be able to continue to deliver our education to the students. Um, synchronous access refers to learning in real time. So we will have uh, uh, available to us Microsoft Teams and Micro Microsoft Stream in combination with web cameras. Um, they will be used in classroom instruction to allow students to attend class sessions synchronously and remotely. Lectures will be recorded for asynchronous access and in compliance with ADA regulations, including voice to text captioning. Now, with regards to scheduling guidelines for lecture courses, the deans and the unit heads will soon be consulting with their faculty to learn of the faculty's preferred teaching modality or modalities if the faculty are teaching more than one course and the deans and unit heads will then report this information to the registrar. Consideration will be given to the school's priorities for courses offered in the traditional classroom course modality, as well as in the fully online course modality. Those are the two extremes. And in consultation with educational technology services um, to prioritize the development of new fully online courses. When updating the fall 2020 course schedule, the registrar will take into, consi into consideration student enrollment, space requirements, and classroom configurations, space availability, and instructor needs and preferences. And each um, modality or the modality for each course and for each section will be noted in the course schedule. Once the um, revised schedule is set, the registrar will notify each student by email of any changes in the modality of their scheduled courses, and this will allow the students to have the option of being able to make changes to their schedules. One thing that we are looking at right now um, is because of the restrictions in occupancy placed by six foot social distancing guidelines, it is likely that courses with more than 120 enrolled students will need to be offered either in the remote or virtual course mode or the fully online mode. And this simply has to do with the reduced occupancy in these larger lecture halls, which have fixed table and fixed seat um, furniture. Um, I expect to add to this framework in the coming days, scheduling guidelines for laboratory courses. This is the piece of the framework that's currently missing. The guidelines for the laboratory courses um, will be added once the Office of Facility completes their determination of the social distancing capacities of our 210 classrooms. So, Raphael, thank you. Thank you, Inga, for uh, that very thorough review. I think that answered most of the questions we had received about uh, courses and academics in the fall. Before we move on to our next topic, I want to uh, circle back uh, a couple of questions that have come in through the chat. Uh, the first one I will uh, direct to Dr. Benson. Uh, can we know why UT Dallas wasn't given Juneteenth off? There are many companies and universities both within Texas and outside Texas that were given this day off. Uh, uh, thanks, Raphael. Actually, Colleen Dutton can back me up on this one, but in fact, we do have Juneteenth off. Um, but it's one of several holidays throughout the year which we cluster at the end of the calendar year. So that, that winter break, you know, around Christmas, New Year's Day, uh, when we cluster a, a bunch of uh, days off, we, we, we have actually drawn them uh, from other days throughout the year. So I, I, for some number of years in the state of Texas, uh, we have had, um, you know, a, a holiday, uh, well, not on Juneteenth, but in celebration of Juneteenth. And uh, Colleen, can you add or correct anything <laughs> that I just said? 
No, that is correct. And and people can look at the holiday list that's posted online and see which holidays that uh, we use to apply towards winter break so that we can have a longer winter break. And we, we do that with a variety of the holidays, LBJ birthday, Confederate Heroes Day, Juneteenth, um, drawing a blank, um, San Jacinto Day. So there's several that we apply to winter break. Thank you. Very good, thank you both. Uh, Dr. Jameson, a follow-up question for you. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Tobar, Tobor food delivery robots. Will the robots be sanitized and on what schedule? Uh, they'll be thoroughly san sanitized um, after each uh, delivery. Um, uh, auxiliary services working with the vendors work on the best process to address that. Uh, so after each, each delivery, they come back, they'll be sanitized. Very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, and one more for Colleen. Um, uh, the question is, did Colleen say that all employees must monitor their health daily? Yes, I did say that. And so those who are coming to campus, if you're not coming into campus, then you will not be required to complete the daily health assessment. But if you are reporting to campus, um, you will be required to do so. Um, the Office of Research is piloting this program right now, so it's very limited access now. Uh, we do have a small group in JSOM that are also completing the daily health assessments, but it'll be rolled out campus-wide as people return to campus. Very good, thank you, Colleen. Um, so I'd like to move on to the next group of questions that have to do with uh, on-campus housing and student life in the fall, and I'll direct these uh, primarily to uh, Dr. Fitch. Um, the first question, uh, if I decide to take the option of staying home in the fall, would I have on-campus on housing for the spring? Can I pay for spring 2021 semester only? Okay, the answer to that question is, uh, you would be unable to pay for your spring semester in advance. However, you can contact the housing office to transfer your housing application to the spring, but unfortunately we cannot guarantee that we would have spring housing available for you. Very good. Uh, a related question. Uh, I'm an out-of-state student and I have already signed up for Canyon Creek housing. However, I will probably be choosing the online option. If I don't need housing anymore for the fall, what do I do? Right, good question. And similar to the, the previous answer, we would need you to contact University Housing Office and notify them of your decision. And you can do that through the housing uh, email address. That's housing at utdallas.edu. Very good. Um, due to uncertainty, re uncertainty related to uh, COVID-19, will the cancellation dates for housing be extended so that students who need to cancel fall housing won't be penalized? Okay, the cancellation dates will remain the same, but we also understand that this is a very unique situation. So if a student cancels their housing, we will work with them uh, on an individual basis. So again, we will have you contact housing and we'll work with you on that. Very good. Um, the next question uh, may be um, directed to, uh, to Calvin. Uh, for students who will not be on campus and who have a meal plan, will that meal plan be refunded? Uh, it's similar to the way it's set up now. Uh, the answer is yes, short answer. But uh, for most students who live on campus, who live in a res residence hall, they have to have a meal plan. So it's nothing changes in that regard. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, um, next question for Dr. Fitch. Uh, our airport pickup volunteers want to know what the protocol is for quarantining international students or other students flying into Dallas to attend the university? Do they need to quarantine? Does it need to be done by the airport or other location? Is this or is it not a requirement? Okay, another good question. So if a student arrives from a country that's identified as high risk, they'll be expected to quarantine. And we are making arrangements to identify off-campus facilities for students who may need to isolate. So that would be, um, I guess, the easiest answer to this very difficult question. Very good, thank you, Gene. Um, a question on uh, student life. Will the school allow on-campus organizations to meet and have meetings uh, as they used to, or will there be rules regarding uh, those types of events? Okay, is our intention uh, to, to hold events on campus this fall, but we will follow guidance from local, state, and federal agencies to ensure compliance 
with social distancing protocols. Uh, additionally, we're exploring ways to expand our virtual programming and services. We're also looking uh, for guidance from those agencies on allowing spectators to attend our athletic events. So we were going into the fall with every intention to hold events, but again, uh, under strict social distancing protocols. Very good. Uh, a question for Dr. Jameson uh, about uh, bus service. How will the bus schedules be affected by extra cleaning precautions? How much of a delay can riders expect? Uh, that's a very good question. At present, we're working with DART regarding the fall schedule. And it, it appears at present that uh, based on the cleaning schedule, it's probably delayed about 10 minutes. At present, that turnaround is about every 30 minutes, so it may be a little longer in, in order to allow us to uh, uh, sanitize the buses. In addition, if you want to ride the bus, you must have a mask or you will be asked to. Um, <clears throat> at, at present, we're trying to make it so that if you, if you don't have a mask, um, first couple of days we may have some available for you, but after that, uh, you need to have a mask to get on the bus. Very good. Thank you, Calvin. Uh, before we move on to the uh, the final sections of questions that we received through email, um, just one more follow up uh, question from the chat, um, and I will direct this one to uh, Dr. Musselman. Uh, if a student starts out in person, would they have an option? Uh, I'm assuming in class in person, would they have an option to transition to online if they or a family member becomes sick and they wanted to continue their education? Hello, Raphael. I think, as I mentioned earlier, every class, every class section will have an asynchronous component. So if a student needs to pull back from class and continue to take the class online in that asynchronous fashion, uh, they can do that. Very good. Thank you for the clarification. Um, moving on to uh, our final couple of sections of questions as we're getting close to, uh, to our hour. Uh, I will direct these uh, back to Dr. Benson. Uh, the first uh, relates to uh, commencement ceremonies. Are there are there any plans for fall 2020 commencement ceremonies? Will they still happen? Will they be postponed? Well, thanks, Raphael. Um, we are still determining how we can honor our graduating students and practice uh, appropriate social distancing. And as always, we will consult with local, state, and federal agencies on the best way to celebrate while also focusing on the well-being of our community and guests. And I would say, you know, there will come a day when we have that vaccine and better treatment uh, for the coronavirus. And um, I, I eagerly wait that day, which will then allow us to get back to uh, the normal sorts of celebrations and protocols that we have on campus. Um, a related question uh, um, about uh, from uh, doctoral student, well, doctoral candidates, and I'm assuming other graduates um, who have uh, missed hooding ceremonies or graduation ceremonies be able to participate in those ceremonies in the future? Uh, absolutely. That, that is such a special ceremony. I wouldn't deny it to anybody. So we don't know when we can get back to doing that, but whenever we do, uh, I would welcome uh, every one of our uh, new uh, PhDs um, and their advisors, you know, to participate in the ceremony. It's one of the, uh, one of the most interesting and enjoyable things that we do on campus. Very good. Uh, a final couple of questions about the spring semester. Uh, will spring classes officially be all in person? Um, and uh, have we decided about housing and dining options um, uh, for the full academic year if we aren't sure about classes in the spring? Well, uh, this will this will uh, resemble the question I just gave about commencement. Much depends on our ability to uh, fight off the, the COVID-19 disease. So um, if, if we're in the same situation as we are now, then I think the spring 2021 semester will look an awful lot like the fall 2020. Um, as I say, there will come a day when we have a vaccine and we can start to uh, return to, uh, well, it, uh, transition into what we would call the new normal, which will uh, allow far greater social gathering. Very good. Well, that, uh, concludes all the questions that we have. I know we have some more questions in the chat, but we have uh, we have consumed the hour that we have scheduled for this event. Uh, as Dr. Benson mentioned uh, at, at, in his opening remarks, we will try to get to all of those questions uh, offline. But at this time, I would like to turn it back to Dr. Benson for some closing words. Well, uh, th thank you, Raphael. Thanks to everybody who participated. Uh, thanks again to um, academics 
uh, Senate staff council and student government uh, for being the sponsors of this uh, town hall. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to engage with the UTD community. Uh, I want to thank everybody who supplied a question. Um, uh, it was a great array. It, it, it helps focus our thinking and uh, to know what we need to be addressing um, uh, at UTD. Uh, as you can all appreciate, there is still a great deal of uncertainty um, you know, in, in the nation, in the world uh, right now, and we're trying to find the best path forward that we can and one that allows us to, to uh, act on the, the, the core mission of this university, which is to educate some very fine students. Um, so we, we want to do that. Uh, we, we want to be back in session. Um, we want to get back to our, our lives on campus. But again, we're going to take every precaution uh, that is necessary and we're going to be flexible. Um, I hope that um, we, we see some fine developments in, in the future that allow us to um, act uh, with, with greater confidence that we're going to be healthy and safe. Um, and if things trend in the wrong direction, then we will react to that as well. But um, um, it, you know, we're doing the very best we can to, to keep UTD running, uh, th this, this wonderful university of ours. And I, uh, I want to echo something that I said at the very beginning, which is thank you to everybody, faculty, staff, and students. Um, you know, since about March, maybe even before that, we've all been reacting to something quite extraordinary in our lives. And uh, in my uh, opinion, no one has done it better than UT Dallas. So um, as we continue to fight our way forward, again, I want to thank you all for everything that you're doing uh, to make uh, UT Dallas successful. And uh, we will we we look forward to getting back together um, in some fashion uh, this fall um, at our beautiful campus. So thanks, everybody.